reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must leave, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down, and power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. This fourth Sunday of Easter, almost the halfway point in the 50 day Easter season, is also known by a couple other titles. It is called Good Shepherd Sunday, since the Gospel reading every year on the fourth Sunday of Easter has the theme of Jesus the Shepherd guiding the disciples' flock. Yet it's also the World Day of Prayer for Vocations, highlighting our need for more shepherds to shepherd Christ's church, to guide the flock of the faithful through the preaching and teaching and the serving that they do. I'll talk a little bit more on that topic later on, but let me first set the stage through sharing a true story which will outline as an analogy the rest of what I'm going to talk about in terms of hearing the voice of the shepherd and following as a sheep. (laughs) Recently I saw a TV interview concerning an amazing occurrence which had received a lot of press in its day. Back on July 9th of 1960, Three people were out to take a pleasant boat ride on the Niagara River, north of Buffalo. There was seven-year-old Roger Woodward, his 17-year-old sister Deanne, and their dad's friend named Jim Honeycutt. Now, for some reason, Jim steered his 12-foot boat beyond the river limit, and they got caught up in the rapids of the river. And to make matters worse, their motor conked out. The three of them were headed to the brink of Niagara Falls. Well, a big wave then struck the boat, and it capsized. Now, little Roger and Deanne both had life jackets on. Jim did not. Well, Deanna ended up clinging to a branch extending over the water from Goat Island, hanging just 15 feet from the edge of the falls. Talk about terror. Luckily, two men on Goat Island safely pulled her in. Jim, however, was not so lucky. His body was found four days later down the river. What happened to Roger? Well, this seven-year-old boy, who didn't even know how to swim, went over the Horseshoe Falls with nothing on but a bathing suit and a life jacket and missed every single rock at the bottom of the falls, escaping with only a few minor bruises. He was finally picked up by one of those made of the mist tour boats at the bottom of the falls, and photos of Roger in the water being rescued made the papers all over the globe. And he is to this day the only person to survive a spill over the Horseshoe Falls without any daredevil devices at age seven. Well, as this TV interview went on with the now adult Roger Woodward, it was said that for many years after that ordeal, Roger and his sister didn't talk much at all about what happened that day. And Roger, for many years, had struggled with the question, why? 
Why did he and his sister have to live through something like that, and their friend Jim didn't make it? For what purpose was it all? Well, as Roger was growing up, especially as a teenager, people kept coming up to him and telling him, you know, Roger, someone's watching over you. Someone has something special planned for you through this. And as an adult, he actually became a devout Christian. And he shared his ordeal all over the country in various churches. And in 1990, Roger said this, and I quote, For the first time in my life, I know what God's purpose is in saving me. Something happened over 30 years ago that was very, very special. I lived. Why? So that I could live again. So that others would come to the saving knowledge of Christ and have the gift of eternal life. End quote. Roger said that only by the grace of God could he and his sister Deanne survive such an ordeal. And such a near-death experience, he said, helped him to, quote, have a totally different perspective on life, appreciating every breath of life, end quote. This miraculous journey of Rogers, I think, serves as a wonderful analogy for our own lives and how God is constantly calling out to us about his love for us. And he's constantly trying to draw us closer to him in that love. Sometimes things can be going smoothly and peacefully, like the beginning of their boat trip, everything going according to plan in our lives. But then life can suddenly become more turbulent, like the rapids that the three of them found themselves in suddenly, maybe leaving us to wonder in life, what's going on? What's going to happen next? And maybe we've had scary or close call experiences when we went over the edge, so to speak making us ponder how we could possibly survive such a traumatic moment in our lives. And such times can change our lives forever. And yet, God continues to call out to us in all those different kinds of times. Not just the traumatic ones, but at quieter, happier, peaceful times. But I think the question in that is, how well are we listening? Do we notice God's voice calling out to us constantly? And how did God finally get our attention, if at all? God never stops calling out to us before, during, and after such life-changing moments, or before, during, and after our baptism, or before, during, and after sharing in the Eucharist. Jesus the Shepherd is always on the job for his sheep, loving us, guiding us, trying to protect us, and helping us to see things more through his eyes and not our own limited vision. This call is constant. Yet are we allowing our lives to be more conducive to hearing whatever his current call is in our life? For example, do we allow for silent moments each day to try to listen to God's still voice? Or do we keep surrounding ourselves with noise? Do we take time to open ourselves up to the possibility of hearing his voice speaking personally to us through the Bible, through Mass, through prayer? Or are we making ourselves too busy to hear God and to bond more with Christ? You know, the word vocation actually comes from a Latin word, vocare, which means to call. And we're not just talking about the call to be priests, deacons, or religious here, but it's our common call by Christ to believe in him and to follow his lead. And you can think of the many wonderful ways that Jesus showed his love and call in the Gospels. For example, healing the sick, giving hope to the poor, teaching things like forgiveness and love and peace, among many other wonderful things. And all of us can do those things in some way every day, with whatever time, talent, or treasure we may have. For example, it doesn't take much effort to smile at a person. 
Yet many people go around looking like they're perpetually angry, or sad, or numb. Yes, folks, there are a lot of sourpusses in the world. You know, just a smile should communicate to someone so beautifully, God loves you. God's in control. Things will work out all right in the end. A smile can go a long way. This Good Shepherd Sunday and Day of Prayer for Vocations means a lot to me personally, as I, I know it does for my fellow priests in the diocese. Did you know that we now have in our diocese 152 priests shepherding in our diocese? I am one of only 91 active priests, and five others are currently working outside of the diocese right now. And 41 priests are retired, but most are still active. Even some of them were in their late 80s. 11 priests serve here from other countries. And nine others are religious order priests. And in June, we will have four more ordained. And that's the biggest ordained group of priests for our diocese in several decades. And behind those four, we have about 19 seminarians among our largest number of seminarians since the 1980s. So I think with those statistics, there's certainly hope on the horizon. But you know, we still have a great need for more priests, especially when you consider that the average age of priests right now in our diocese is 61. It'll be interesting to see how our local diocesan church will look in 10 years with more deaths and retirements on the way. Now, keep in mind that there are probably about 350,000 Catholics to serve in our diocese now. And with 152 priests, that's about one priest per 2,300 people. Boy, do we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> our three deacons, Tom, Dan, and Rick, are among the 115 active permanent deacons that we have in our diocese, with 35 more retired ones, answering Christ's call in so many great and much-needed ways to keep the flock fed. And in June, we plan on ordaining one permanent deacon, along with three transitional ones, who will hopefully be ordained priests next year in June. So, folks, we are truly blessed in our diocese, not only through those ordained or those who've taken religious vows, but with you and all the other Christian sheep who bring the love and hope of the Good Shepherd every single day in countless ways, large ways and small ways. And who knows how the Lord may be calling each of us in the future. We never know how or when the Lord will touch us and change our lives dramatically, especially for the better. That reminds me of a young couple a few years ago that I worked with when I was pastor in East Rochester at St. Jerome's Church. Their names are Brandon and Adrian. And they were answering God's call to marriage. So they approached me and they showed a desire to grow in their faith life and to publicly declare their great love for each other in the eyes of God through his church. And Adrian and Brandon sensed some divine signs in being brought together. For example, when they first met with me, they told me about when they first met. And they went on a date and they started talking in the college class, started dating each other. And they were amazed to discover that they were baptized as babies on the same day, in the same church, in the same ceremony. And they also found out that each had a parent that worked with each other. Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> now it sounds like Twilight Zone stuff, but I believe everything happens in life for a reason according to God's plan. And the two of them sensed that with being brought together as if God intended them to be married with each other. Thus, marriage is a vocation. But we also have to remember, single life is just as valid a vocation as marriage. We all hunger to do good, to make a difference in our lives, in the world around us. And sometimes we pursue a call and then we sense we need more in life, and maybe we need a change. Sometimes we think one way will fulfill us, only to find out that it didn't fulfill us the way that we had hoped. A radio career was like that for me years ago, only I discovered through people and various situations that Jesus had another call. You know, when I was ordained at Sacred Heart Cathedral on June 5th of 1999, as I was prostrated out 
on the floor, my belly down, face down, and I was actually weeping tears of joy at that moment as I was being prayed over, a song popped into my head which seemed to encapsulate my whole life's journey up to that moment. And it's a big pop hit from 1974 that many of you may know if you listen to a lot of radio. It's by one of the all-time great pop music groups, Chicago. And they had a hit song that year called, I've Been Searching So Long. And here's how the opening lyrics go as they scroll through my mind that special day. As my life goes on, I believe somehow something's changed. Something deep inside of me, a part of me. There's a strange new light in my eyes. Things I've never known. Change in my life. Change in me. I've been searching so long to find an answer. Now I know my life has meaning. Just like Roger Woodward, folks. <laughs> what have you been searching for your whole life? And did you find it? Or are you still looking for it? And think of the wonderful changes our Lord still has in store for you. Ones that really radically may surprise you. Listen closely for the shepherd's voice calling out to you each day as Jesus continues to reveal his plans for you. And then what you do? Follow the leader as the sheep. Because he knows what's best for us and what wonders are still to come for us. <laughs>